We can then view uh, our transmission lines as simply a conduit which allows us to uh, uh, deliver energy from some source along the transmission line into some load, some match device into another match device. And as long as these devices have port impedances, output or input impedances that are numerically equal to Z0, uh, then the length of the transmission line doesn't matter. We have uh, a situation where all the available power of one port will be delivered then to that other port. And so this idea of a transmission line as a conduit, <clears throat> as a pipe of electromagnetic energy, certainly is a valid one. But there's another application of our transmission lines uh, with respect to microwave engineering. We find that transmission lines are likewise useful in the construction of useful microwave devices. Um, uh, once again, I want to emphasize that we have a link to transmission line. Its characteristic impedance, C0, if it's lossless, is purely real. It sounds like a resistor. But of course, we know that this transmission line is a two-port device that is made up, if it's lossless, of inductance and capacitance. And of course, that exhibits itself with respect to the impedance matrix, the trans-impedance parameters of this two-port device. Every one of those elements is uh, purely imaginary and therefore indicates a reactive device. On top of that, the line impedance function that we calculate may be both real and imaginary and will change as we move up and down the line. Of course, to the extent that it changes and the values of the real imaginary part of that line impedance it will depend ultimately on what the line is terminated in. So again, the characteristic impedance is real, the line impedance function changes with respect to position and is both real and imaginary, generally speaking, and the trans impedance parameters are purely imaginary <coughs> values, indicating that the two-port device is made up of simply inductive and capacitance if it is a lossless two-port device. And so we're going to use this element, this two-port device that's purely reactive, to construct reactive elements that are useful to us in constructing the circuits uh, that are beneficial in microwave engineering. The manner in which we create a uh, reactive one-port device, as we've discussed before, is to terminate our transmission line with a load that is purely reactive. Of course, the simplest reactive loads to uh, construct are those of a short circuit or that of an open circuit. In either case, what we find is that the resulting input impedance is going to be purely reactive. As we discussed before, if we terminate a lossless transmission line, purely inductive and capacitive, with a reactive load, then the input impedance, as well as the line impedance at every point on the transmission line must be purely reactive. For the case of a short circuit, for example, we found that the input impedance had this, um, uh, this um, uh, form, this structure, the uh, mathematical statement. And we see that input impedance is uh, purely imaginary. Now, this input impedance could be inductive, positive, or reactance, I should say, should be, could be uh, inductive, positive or capacitive negative, depending on the value of tangent beta L. Tangent, of course, could be a positive value or a negative value, beta L being the electrical length of the line. So we look at this and we see that we can adjust the reactance of this input impedance by simply going through and changing either the characteristic impedance of the transmission line or the electrical length itself, the physical length when multiplied by beta L. By doing this, we can create a reactance, which is uh, uh, the required reactance that we might have for a single one port device. You might be asking yourself, why would we do this? Why would we go through and make a one port device, a reactive one port device, um, using a length of transmission line? Well, when we go to very high frequencies, when a mega gets very large, plausible reactances, uh, reactances that are either not too large or not too small, they need to be uh, um, constructed from capacitances or inductances that are very tiny. So we have uh, mega L to be plausible, not too big or small, then we, and omega is very large, uh, then L needs to be essentially uh, very small. And the problem with that is the 
uh, parasitic inductances and capacitance that are associated with our basic leaded or lumped element capacitances and inductances. Uh, these leads have inductance themselves, and of course there's a capacitance between the two leads, and these parasitic values are generally speaking at low frequency, so uh, small that they are insignificant and we can ignore, th ignore them. But at very high frequencies, the microwave frequencies, then these, react these uh, capacitive inductances, capacitances, uh, not only are significant, they may in fact be larger than the uh, value of L and C that we would like to create. Now we can go through and try to build structures now that are much smaller, that minimize the length of the leads, uh, so-called chip um, uh, devices in terms of resistors or inductors or capacitors. Uh, but those are, at some point, become very difficult uh, to build and, of course, uh, difficult to deal with with respect to manufacturing these very tiny structures that we're trying to solder onto a circuit board. So instead, we have a, a different approach. The different approach is to use uh, links of transmission line as our reactive elements in our engineering structures. And again, we could go through and terminate a transmission line of some length, the shorter open, and create a one-port device of a given reactance. We also could take a length of transmission line, which is a reactive two-port device, and generate a uh, trans impedance parameters, or impedance matrix, rather, that are useful for some circuit design. And that's typically how we do microwave engineering. That is really what uh, differentiates microwave engineering from uh, circuit design at lower frequencies, where we might use lumped uh, inductors or lumped capacitors. And so when we look at microwave engineering circuits, they look confusing to us at first because they simply look like links of conductors, wires. In with respect to um, low frequency, uh, they uh, would simply uh, uh, apply KVL and KCL and say that the voltage uh, and current um, at either end is precisely the same. But of course, at high frequencies, the inductance and capacitance per length can um, uh, or will um, be significant, and we have to take those into consideration. And of course, we do that with tr um, telegrapher equations with our knowledge of transmission lines. So this is the structure that we might see, and we've talked about this before. This is a microstrip circuit. The goal that's shown here is the top conductor of our transmission line. The uh, yellow that's between that is the substrate, the uh, dielectric that separates the top conductor from the bottom conductor in our transmission line structure. And the bottom conductor, the bottom wire in the transmission line, is a ground plane that would be on the other side of the structure. So we'd look, be looking down on a printed circuit board and see the top side edge, which is the top of our transmission line lines. The dielectric um, substrate uh, is the uh, structure that separates the wires, and again the ground plane at the bottom would be the second conductor. And so we look at this and again it just sort of looks like uh, uh, some artistic rendering uh, of something, but this is a very useful circuit um, that we have. The different widths of these conductors correspond to different characteristic impedances of the transmission line. And of course, this uh, lambda over four, as you might uh, um, infer, is the electrical length of those transmission lines. These are quarter wave length transmission lines. So this is a very useful device. It's what we call a four port coupler. There's a one, two, three, four ports there. Um, this device is likewise <clears throat> a four port coupler of a different kind. And again, we see that the line links associated with them are lambda over four, a very common uh, value that shows up for the electrical length of our transmission lines in microwave engineering. Likewise, the widths of these conductors are different, corresponding to different characteristic impedances. This is a Wilkinson power divider shown here. We have a resistor value. And then this is a coupled line coupler uh, that we'll talk about later. Once again, we see a lot of electrical links that are a quarter of a wavelength. So we look at this and from a traditional engineering standpoint, this wouldn't look like a circuit at all. We don't see any inductors or capacitors or resistors or transformers or uh, transistors, any, any devices per se. It just looks like conducting wire and it is conducting wire, but remember those conducting wires have inductance and capacitance. And so what we're building here are reactive structures, multi-port structures that do useful uh, things with respect to uh, engineering circuits.
Another uh, example here, uh, and these are photos, so they might have uh, more physical meaning to you. Again, these are what we call microstrip uh, circuits here. We have a, a substrate, just a circuit board here. The gray is the dielectric. On the bottom side, you can't see, is a ground plane, and that's the bottom of our transmission lines. And this conducting structure that you see on top is the top side of a transmission line. So this would be a length of transmission line. Now this appears to be connected to nothing, but uh, in fact, what happens is it is conducting, it is connected from each of these lines or connected together by a capacitive coupling between them. And this is uh, an example of a microwave filter. Again, you look at this and it seems baffling how this would work, uh, but we'll uh, try to get a little bit into this later on in the course. So this is a bandpass filter uh, that is created in microstrip. This is a low-pass filter uh, that's created in microstrip. And here another one is another type of um, bandpass filter. And this is um, uh, what sort of leads uh, other electrical engineers to refer to microwave engineering as black magic because you, know, you look at this and it seems like uh, there's no circuit at all here. But from an electromagnetic standpoint, uh, these links of transmission line, again, are inductive, capacitive, and likewise will add a, um, a coupling capacitance that occurs between these transmission lines. Here is another photo of a microwave circuit, and here we see many devices that are soldered down. These are lumped elements, and these are probably uh, either capacitors or resistors, some integrated circuits and such. But when we get to the microwave part, the high frequency part, we see these structures here, these sort of uh, more of a darker uh, khaki green structures uh, in this circuit board. And again, we see no uh, soldered elements here. These are what we call distributed elements, and these are also filters. Uh, this is a filter structure. This is a filter structure. Likewise, this is a bandpass filter, and this is a bandpass filter as well. So again, we look at this, it sort of looks like some artistic rendering, um, and, and it really has no application, apparently, to um, electrical engineering, but it very much does. These patches right here that you see are basically, again, top side. We see the patch on the bottom side. We have a ground plane, and of course, those become parallel plate capacitors. And so we are building structures that are recognizable as electrical engineering structures, but they are reactive structures of inductance and capacitance and capacitive coupling. Another photo of um, a circuit board. Um, again, the top side etch you see here, and uh, this structure is a four-port device. Uh, again, one input, two, three, four, and this is what we call a directional coupler, and this help us, helps us uh, uh, distribute power. Power comes in one of the ports and then gets, uh, um, uh, then gets uh, distributed in different uh, percentages amongst the other three remaining ports, and we'll talk about that later in the course. Again, I'm not, uh, don't expect you to understand what these things are right now, but we'll try to get into uh, some detail later in the course about these structures. Again, this structure might look some like some whimsical design from a graphic artist, uh, but this is uh, a low-pass filter. Uh, these things look like bow ties, and in fact, these things are called bow tie stubs. So once again, by going through and building uh, uh, distributed elements, essentially links of transmission lines, uh, we can build very useful devices in electrical engineering. All right, let's start talking about the engineering particulars then about these uh, microwave circuits using distributed elements. And uh, the most common structure that we see in um, uh, these microwave circuits uh, is uh, this interface where we have two transmission lines that are connected together. And notice the transmission line characteristic impedance of each are going to be dissimilar. They're going to be different from each other. And so we have a transition of characteristic impedance from one side to the other. And this is the most fundamental of our microwave um, circuit structure. And so let's make sure we understand um, all the uh, uh, specificity, all the intricacies of 
of this structure. The first thing here is that we have a current and voltage solution that satisfies telegrapher equation, and likewise a current and voltage solution that satisfies telegrapher equation, but they are different solution. This function I1 is different than I2, and likewise V1 and V2. The voltage and current on this transmission line have a different function than the voltage and transmission and current on this transmission line. More specifically, the V0 plus and V0 minus on this transmission line will have different values than the complex wave amplitudes of V0 plus and V0 minus on this transmission line. And so we have to be very careful then in how we draw our index to be able to specify these four different functions. In this case, I've drawn an index increasing z, which is continued across the interface from one side to the other. And so you can see that the values of index z uh, for the first transmission line, i1 and z1, are going to be values of z which are less than zero, less than or equal to zero. Likewise, the values of index z for the second transmission line are going to be values that are going to be greater than or equal to zero. At z is equal to zero, for both cases, it means the same thing at this location right here. Now, I've drawn this with a little gap between them to show that uh, um, you know they are connected together. Um, but from a physical standpoint, from an engineering standpoint, these wires that connect them are sh so short that we can ignore completely their inductance and likewise the capacitance between them. These are abutted one to the other. The transition from one transmission line to the other is instant. And so the value of z is equal to zero for both um, indexes, or for both sides, um, indicate this uh, interface, this location, where the two transmission lines are connected together. We might ask ourselves then, is there any relationship between the current and voltage on the first transmission line and the current and voltage on the second transmission line? Of course, each have to individually satisfy telegrapher equations, of course, but is there any relationship between this pair and the, uh, on the left and the pair on the right. And of course there is, and that relationship is determined by boundary conditions. What we have to do is apply a boundary condition at the uh, interface between the two transmission lines. We're gonna apply KVL and KCL uh, at that location because they must hold at that location. And when we do so, we'll find there is a relationship between this current function and this current function, and likewise this voltage and this voltage. To apply those boundary conditions, we first need to explicitly, explicitly write out the total voltage as a function of position index z for the uh, transmission line here on the left, for v1 and i1. And of course, those voltages are solutions for telegrapher equations, and so we can write them um, uh, where we know the uh, complex wave amplitudes of v plus and v minus, in this case, are unknown. Likewise, for current, we can write the total current along the transmission line again in terms of these two unknown wave amplitudes of V0 plus and V0 minus. Along the second transmission line, the transmission on the, light, on the right, we can likewise write the total voltage as a function of position Z and the total current as a function of position Z again in terms of the unknown wave amplitudes of V0 plus and V0 minus. It's crucial to note that this wave amplitude of V0 plus, what I call V02 plus, is not equal to the value of V01 plus, the wave amplitude in the left side uh, for the first transmission line. Likewise, for Z02 minus is different than the uh, complex wave amplitude of V01 minus, the wave amplitude of the minus going wave on the left side. So we have two unknown wave amplitudes here and two unknown wave amplitudes here, and they are both uh, dis, uh, unequal from each other, different from each other. Moreover, the solutions that we have for the total voltage and total current are valid for uh, indexes z greater than zero, or I probably should have said z greater than or equal to zero for each case. Whereas in the previous slide where I talked about v1 and i1 for this transmission line, those functions would be valid over the domain for index z, which is less than or equal to zero. Again, for the values of index z greater than or equal to zero, we're clearly at points on the transmission 
transmission line on the left for values of z less okay, than or equal to zero. Negative values of y z were clearly at points on the transmission line on the left. The transition between the two trans uh, transmission line occur, of course, at the uh, index z is equal to zero. Based on the index that we defined, uh, the location z is equal to zero is where one transmission line connects to the other. And so to apply boundary conditions, we need to know what, uh, what is the voltage and current of each of those two transmission lines at that specific point. And so we evaluate V1 uh, at Z is equal to zero at the end of that transmission line, likewise for I1. And we also evaluate V2 and I2, essentially the voltage and current at the beginning of that second transmission line, uh, the one on the right. And so it's easy to do. We insert the value of uh, zero. We arbitrarily define that location of the index as z is equal to zero and because of that the math turns out to be equal uh, easy rather uh, the complex exponentials turn into values of one and so we have a set of expressions that are relatively simple with respect to voltage and current and of course remember the value of v0 plus and v0 minus is uh, by definition the value of the plus wave voltage at z is equal to zero that's what the substrate substrate uh, subscript rather zero uh, refers to likewise for uh, v0 minus the subscript zero again refers to the minus wave voltage at z is equal to zero so uh, again this makes perfect sense uh, with in terms of our results. What then are our boundary conditions? How do we relate uh, the current at the end of this line to the current here at the beginning of the second line? How do we relate the voltage at the end of this first line to the voltage here at the beginning of the second line? Well, hopefully it's uh, evident to you how they are related. They are related by KCL with respect to the currents and KVL with respect to the voltages. Applying KVL, uh, applying KVL then at the transition and using the results uh, that we have for the total voltage on transmission line one and the total voltage at transmission line two when evaluated at z is equal to zero, we see that we have a relationship now that relates the wave amplitudes of V0 plus and V0 minus for the first transmission line to the uh, wave amplitudes of V0 plus and V0 minus for the second transmission line. So this is our first expression. For our second expression, we can apply KCL, and it says that the current uh, for the first transmission line, when evaluated right here at the end of the line, must be equal to the current of the second transmission line, when again evaluated right here at the beginning of that line. And so the current leaving this first transmission line must be equal to the current entering the second transmission line. Again, I uh, emphasize that this is for I1 and I2 are equal when evaluated at this one location here. Oftentimes, again, students will tell me that the function I1z is equal to the function I2z. And of course, that's completely uh, untrue. In fact, it can't be true because the uh, function for I1 over here is defined only in the domain where z is less than zero or less than or equal to zero. And, um, and the current function I2 is defined only over here for the values of z, which are greater than or equal to zero. So only at the point where z is equal to zero can we apply an equality, uh, and that is when we evaluate these functions at one specific value of z at zero, and that gives us a result that we show here. So we have two then results here that we uh, relate the uh, plus and minus wave voltage on the left side to the plus and minus wave voltage on the right side. So can we take those two equations and then solve for those unknown complex amplitudes? Well, turns out we can't, of course. We have two equations and four unknowns. To be able to find those values, uh, we would need to know what also is connected in the rest of the circuit. But this is a set of mathematics which must be satisfied uh, with our result, that the relationships between the complex wave amplitudes must satisfy this equation and the previous equation. There's an infinite number of them that can, but of course there's an infinite number of them that won't. And so this is a part of our mathematical structure that we're putting together to try to analyze these circuits. Now, if we took those two previous results together and combined them, we would get uh, essentially this result 
um, uh, that is shown here. If I take the ratio of V1 uh, at the uh, transition to I1 at the transition um, and uh, the ratio of V2 to I2 at that same transition, we would find that they must be equal to each other. So there's a, another statement, which is really combining our KVL and KCL uh, solutions. But of course, we know that the ratio of total voltage to total current is the line impedance function. So another way of stating this uh, boundary condition between two uh, transmission lines is that the line impedance function of the first transmission line when evaluated at the interface at z is equal to zero must likewise be equal to the line impedance function at the uh, uh, other transmission line on the right side when evaluated at z is equal to zero. Again, this does not mean that the function z1 is going to be equal to the function z2 with respect to position z. Those two functions in general will look nothing like each other, and once again, they don't even have the same domain. One function is evaluated or is uh, uh, defined for index z that is negative and the other for index z that is positive. What we're saying is the values of these two dissimilar functions when evaluated at the same point z is equal to zero must have the same numeric value. That is a boundary condition that occurs. And so what we find is what we're saying is that the voltage, total voltage, must be continuous across the boundary. The total current must be continuous across the boundary. And now we find that the line impedance, therefore, because of those two statements, must be continuous across that boundary as well. So again, we made the conclusion that the total voltage and total current and line impedance functions are continuous across our boundary. And with the interface between the two transmission lines, the uh, uh, total voltage, total current, and line impedance function on either side must be uh, equal to each other as they come together. From that, students often then conclude that it must likewise be true for our fundamental wave functions. These, of course, are our fundamental circuit functions, total voltage, total current, and line impedance. What about plus voltage, minus voltage, reflection coefficient? If these three functions are continuous across the boundary, the interface, then of course, these three functions must be as well. But that is, in fact, not the case. This is true, but this sorry, these three equations are not true. So these are incorrect. Again, sometimes students erroneously make this conclusion, uh, but they are incorrect. So why is that? Why aren't they continuous across the boundary? Well, to get our boundary conditions, we applied the physical knowledge, KVL, KCL, uh, and that led to our boundary conditions. But there is no um, physical statement or requirement, no physical law, uh, that says that the uh, plus wave voltage on one side of the interface must be equal to the plus wave voltage at the other. There is no justification for that, and in fact, it is uh, almost never the case. There's always a discontinuity of the plus wave voltage from one side to the other when two transmission lines come together. The same for the minus wave voltage and the same for the reflection coefficient function. You kind of see, hopefully, that if the total voltage is different but has to be continuous on either side and the total current is different function uh, on either side but must be the same at the boundary, uh, likewise for the line impedance function, to satisfy those three equations, almost certainly these three equations cannot be satisfied. And so we see where I've talked over and over again about how the wave viewpoint on the transmission line oftentimes is a more fundamental and easier uh, viewpoint to apply. We have magnitudes that are constant across the transmission line of plus wave voltage and minus wave voltage and reflection coefficient function. Those functions change simply with respect to uh, position, the phase rather, changes simply with respect to position along the transmission line proportional to z uh, with respect to 2 beta or beta or minus beta, whereas for total voltage, total current, and impedance as we move up and down the line, it's a big mess, both in terms of magnitude and phase. The point where uh, total voltage, total current, and impedance is most useful and the wave viewpoint breaks down is at these boundary conditions. 
Uh, we saw that both with respect to loads and source, we had to apply boundary conditions that were KVL, KCL, and likewise with respect to the transition between two transmission lines. Again, we can apply boundary conditions with respect to KVL and KCL. Again, there is no real equivalent there uh, with respect to the wave viewpoint of plus voltage, minus voltage, and reflection coefficient. Mm -hmm. One subtle but very important point with respect to this uh, boundary condition and the uh, um, uh, continuity across uh, the interface between one transmission line and the other uh, that comes up quite a bit. Our students say, well, gee, you know, the line impedance, you say, is continuous across that boundary from one transmission line to the other. And you've made a big deal about how line impedance and reflection coefficient are equivalent. There's a duality that we go back for every impedance. There's a gamma and a gamma. There's an impedance. And so if the line impedance is continuous across the boundary and the line impedance is a dual with reflection coefficient why isn't the reflection coefficient likewise con continuous across that transition why can't we evaluate the reflection coefficient on either side for gamma 1 and gamma 2 at z is equal to 0 and get the same answer and that's a very good question and the result is important uh, to understand The answer to this uh, uh, conundrum, to this uh, confusion, um, uh, can be seen if we carefully understand and define the reflection coefficient for each of the two transmission lines. So the reflection coefficient function on the transmission line on, uh, on the left, uh, gamma 1, uh, we define, of course, uh, by definition as the line impedance, Z1, minus the characteristic impedance of that transmission line, Z01, divided by, of course, the sum of those two values as well. On the other hand, if we look at the reflection coefficient gamma 2, we take the line impedance on that second line, the line on the right, and we subtract from it the characteristic impedance of that transmission line on the right. Remember, the characteristic impedance Z02 is different than Z01. So let's go through and evaluate these two functions precisely at the interface at z is equal to zero. When we do, we get this result for gamma 1, and we get this result for gamma 2. <clears throat> Notice z1 at z is equal to zero and z2 at z is equal to zero, zero, they are equal to each other. But this value, gamma 1 at zero and gamma 2 at zero, are not equal to each other, not because the line impedances are different, they are in fact the same at z is equal to zero. The problem is the characteristic impedances are different. And so even though the line impedances are continuous across that boundary, the reflection coefficient functions are not continuous across the boundary, not because the impedances are discontinuous, but because the characteristic impedance is discontinuous. Because the characteristic impedance is different on either side of the boundary, we find the reflection coefficient on either side will likewise be different and discontinuous as well. The impedances are continuous across the boundary, the reflection coefficient is not. <clears throat>